Hello, we're going to do Isham Textbook Chapter 9, Disinfection. So please open to page, it's in the book, I swear, um, 161. Look at the learning objectives on 161 and then turn to page 162. Okay, so let's skip the introduction. I'm going to let you read that on your own. In fact, a lot of this, I'm going to let you read it on your own, and I fully expect you to. Um, let's talk about the Spalding classification system. The Spalding classification system divides patient care items into three different categories based on um, how they're used, how they contact the patient. So there are non-critical items. And in the Spalding classification system, non-critical items are things that may touch intact skin, not bleeding ulcer skin, intact skin. Things like thermometers, hydrotherapy tanks, stethoscopes, bedpans. These use intermediate to low level disinfection. So it will kill vegetative bacteria. Um, it's not going to destroy spores at all. Semi-critical, these are things that touch mucous membranes like uh, endotracheal tubes, colon colonoscopes, esophageal scopes. If it touches your tongue or you know goes in the other direction, we're talking about a non-clean area. And so it is not considered necessary to have sterility on the things that are going into this area. <clears throat> Semi-critical requires high-level disinfection. High-level disinfection is a disinfection process that will kill all vegetative organisms and leave and even some spores, but uh, mostly it leaves spores. Spores are a, um, a bacteria that is gone into a self-preservation mode. They're very difficult to kill. Critical items. These are things you need to sterilize according to the Spalding classification system. These include surgical instruments, needles, implants, sterilization is required. These are going into a normally sterile area of the body. Where would you place these? A, um, a tongue retractor being used in a tonsillectomy set. Trick question. Tonsillectomies, in this case, although it is in the mouth, um, through the mouth, tonsillectomy uh, needs to be sterile. That tricks you. But when they're removing the tonsil, then um, they are going to draw blood. Okay. In the green box on page 163, you have all of these terms. Please learn the terms. Especially the difference between sterile, high-level disinfection, low-level disinfection, intermediate-level disinfection. These are all very different. Low-level disinfection destroys vegetative bacteria, some fungus, and lipid viruses, but not spores. Intermediate-level disinfection um, kills viruses, all viruses mycobacteria, fungus, and vegetative bacteria, but not spores. High level disinfection will destroy everything and some spores. And then sterile sterilization should destroy everything. Okay. There are many types of disinfectants. Intermediate level, low level. Uh, we tend to group these together as one group of just housekeeping, okay? Doing surfaces on tabletops, um, stethoscopes, thermometers, things that don't go into the patient, intermediate to low. Then there's a huge gulf between intermediate to low and high level um, because high level disinfection can kill spores. And then there's a really huge gulf between high level disinfection and sterilization. Okay, on page 164, learn the definition of organic materials. Organic materials can uh, interfere with a disinfectant's ability to do the disinfection. It can make the disinfectant deactivate. Now, we are going to talk about 
intermediate level and low level disinfectants. There's quaternary ammonium compounds, we usually call quats. Note that it is not sporicidal. It also has compatibility issues with soap. Um, it could be inactivated or absorbed by cotton or charcoal. It's not very effective against a lot of things. It's really useful for doing floors and walls and furniture, quats. Ethyl or isopropyl alcohol. If you are using this as a disinfectant, it is because the instructions for use on something has called for it to be used, like maybe the contact points on a, uh, a intravenous pump module. Okay, <clears throat> alcohol though is a better antiseptic than it is a disinfectant. It's really good for inanimate o or animate objects like your hands, animate. Disinfectants are used on inanimate objects this is an inanimate object, it is an object. And then there's antiseptics which are used on animate flesh. So, um, alcohol is both, but it is not the best kind of disinfectant. It evaporates very fast. And this is a problem because wet contact time for alcohol is five minutes, five, ten minutes. Um, and if it won't stay wet on a surface for at least five minutes, it's not going to be a good disinfectant. Uh, you probably know from experience that alcohol does uh, evaporate very quickly. Okay. Phenolics are another intermediate level disinfectant that is used for housekeeping. Phenolics will leave a residual film after use and that film can be reactivated later by damp mopping. So this is a problem if left on medical devices. I have never seen an instructions for use on a medical device or piece of equipment that required phenolics to be used. Um, housekeeping surfaces, floors and walls, not sporicidal. Wait, did I say it? Alcohol, not sporicidal. So quats, alcohol, phenolics, not sporicidal. They will not disinfect well enough to be considered a high level disinfection. Chlorine. Chlorine is not Sporicidal. Chlorine is actually very bad for instruments. I'm looking for an instrument. I don't have one. I was just going to show it to you in case you forgot what an instrument looks like. Um, it's very damaging to the metal. But chlorine may be used if you are doing, if you are disinfecting dialysis machines or hydrotherapy baths, toilets, laboratories, bathtubs. It's used as bleach for laundry and a sanitizer for dishwashing. It is not something that we commonly use in our sterile processing department, um, but it is capable of killing prions. It doesn't say that in this summary. It's not sporicidal, but it kills prions. How can it do that? Prions are not alive. Um, they're abnormal proteins and it can destroy prions but in doing so it will also destroy the instruments. Chlorine is very very damaging to stainless steel and other metals. It's an intermediate level disinfectant. It's uh, useful for some things in medical. Um, they use it to treat wastewater and sewage. It's not going to be used on instruments. In, now chlorine and iodophores. Iodophores is the next one. These two things are considered to be halogens. If you want to know what that means, then please look it up. Halogens <coughs> um, include chlorine and iodophores. Iodophores are buffered iodines that are also members of the halogen family. Okay, like alcohol, iodophores are used as antiseptics and disinfectants. You'll probably not be using an iodophore to disinfect anything. This is like betadine and iodine. These will damage surfaces of instruments. Um, they stain very, very 
well. They make everything red. Uh, they're good for skin preps. These iodophores are good for skin preps. It's an antiseptic. Okay, moving on to high level disinfectants. All of those that we just talked about are intermediate and low level disinfectants. Now we have high level disinfectants. High level disinfectants include glutaraldehyde and OPA, which is orthoflaldehyde, and hydrogen peroxide and parasitic acid. The two main ones that they might be using are glutaraldehyde and OPA. So glutaraldehyde and OPA both kill by something, a process called alkylation. Okay. That's a chemical reaction where hydrogen is replaced with an alkyl group which causes the cell to be unable to normally metabolize or reproduce or both. So it's dead in the water. It can't, it can't replicate and it can't, um, it can't eat. So it's, it's dead basically. When you're using glutaraldehyde, you have to, um, or with any chemical honestly, you need to consider materials compatibility. So for example, glutaraldehyde is not compatible with latex. If you are using glutaraldehyde, you must use nitrile or butyl gloves. Neither one of these is latex. Glutaraldehyde is not compatible. It will cause the um, latex to become very porous and sticky and it will seep through and get on the person's skin. Glutaraldehyde is usually clear and it turns green when you activate it. Look at the picture on page 168. It shows the gallon of glutaraldehyde which is clear, and then the activator, which is in the smaller bottle, you have to mix those two together before you actually have the disinfectant. Glutaraldehyde is dangerous um, to human life. It needs to be used in a ventilated separate area, separate designated room would be good. A uh, room that has its own ventilation and 10 negative air changes per hour, if that's not possible, then there's a setup on page 169 on the top of the page it's a little cabinet where you can use the glutaraldehyde. Um, glutaraldehyde has a shelf life. I'm sorry, I don't want to talk about the shelf life. I want to talk about the use life. The use life of glutaraldehyde typically is between 14 to 28 days. So once they activate that, they have to document the day that they activated it, and then they can use it for 12 to or I'm sorry, 14 to 28 days, depending on the instructions for use and the facility's policy. So if the facility says, we're throwing it away after 14 days, even if we never used it, then that's what you do because it will only be, be an effective disinfectant for so long.